Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Um, so I will give you all the opportunity to introduce yourselves uh, when we ask the first question um, as well. We have a very interesting panel. We have three very different uh, perspectives um, um, on uh, client engagement for decarbonization. Um, we put the session together. Um, I'm stepping in for somebody who unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, but you know, we put this session together because we did recognize that this is a very important topic across Asia Pacific, across the world. Really, there is a lot of work being done on it. So it'd be interesting to hear the different perspectives on it. Um, you know, as the world uh, transitions towards a low carbon economy, um, you know, financial institutions are uh, under pressure uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of their portfolios. And uh, you know that involves complex trade-offs uh, between financial returns, impact, uh, client preferences, and without engagement, the transition may uh, fail to meet the needs and expectations of clients, which could result in reputational and financial risks for financial institutions. Um, so today we will explore how financial institutions can effectively engage with their clients to understand their preferences, support them in transitioning towards the low carbon economy. Um, we'll discuss the challenges and opportunities of client engagement, um, including the need for transparency, education and communication as well. Um, so perhaps uh, we could start with, uh, with you. Tomo, if you could please um, introduce yourself in 30 seconds. And then perhaps let's start with the opening question of, um, you know, what does client engagement mean from your point of view? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Tomo Ishikawa. I'm a Chief Regulatory Engagement Officer at MEFG. Um, MEFG, uh, as you may know, is a uh, Japan-based uh, financial institution. I represent uh, mainly the commercial banking side of MEFG. We have asset management, we have uh, investment banking operation. We also have, of course, uh, uh, operation outside of uh, Japan. Actually, uh, more than half of our uh, balance sheet, uh, uh, if you look at our, our balance sheet uh, breakdown, is actually more than 50% outside of Japan. So although we're based in Japan, we're a global institution, we're doing you know, all financial uh, services, uh, not only commercial banking, but uh, asset management, et cetera, et cetera. But mainly, uh, everything I'll be speaking will be about commercial banking uh, operation of MEFG. Um, and I want today, what I want to do is to try to, how should I say, demystify what client engagement means for MEFG. And then maybe it will be interesting to uh, discuss how our client engagement will be different from that of, for example, asset management or other uh, financial uh, uh, sectors. So um, let me start by uh, defining what is client engagement for us. Um, in fact, we have client engagement for from two, how should I say, angles. One, because we have our balance sheet size is $3 trillion. It's not a small amount, as you can <laughs> see. $3 trillion of balance sheet. And we have existing exposure, lending exposure to pretty much all the sector that you can think of in Japan or also in Asia. That means, uh, whether it's a good news, bad news, I want to look at it as a positive, but it means we cannot cherry pick. We can't say we want to continue the business with this company or this sector and forget about the, the rest because of sheer size of balance sheet and also the existing relationship. So that means our, when I say, when we say engagement, it means our existing clients and many of whom we have existing lending relationship. And the fact is that uh, we have more than thousand corporate banking coverage banker engaging, engaging or talking to our clients every single day. So this is not like a visiting our clients and talking to them or checking in, I don't know, once a month or once a year. That's not the case. We talk to them maybe every day, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but every week or every month, we are talking to them, to our clients on a regular basis at CEO level, CFO level, but also at the junior, you know, treasury uh, individual or banker, uh, those uh, that are in charge of um, um, 
relationship management with uh, a commercial bank like MEFG. So that's the engagement that we have. And we talk to them no, not just about climate, of course. Climate is, of course, you know, one of three, I guess, top priority agenda. But we've been talking to them about cash management, lending, capex, balance sheet optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So climate is only one subject out of five, ten different uh, themes that we always talk to in terms of our client engagement. So that means um, w because we talk to our clients every day, CEO level, working uh, level, every week, every month, we have full access to data, their strategy, their you know, 20, 30 year plan, uh, how, they, how they want to decarbonize going forward. So uh, well maybe we can discuss about this later, but we, we're not relying on public disclosure. We can talk to our clients every day, understand their strategy, and we can identify the opportunity so that we can help our clients transition to uh, uh, carbon free or net zero economy. So that's how we define our engagement. Maybe that's different from that of asset manager, but we can probably play an important role in facilitating our clients to net zero because we have more access to the management and also data. But of course, our $3 trillion balance sheet is quite sizable, but it doesn't mean we can finance. We've been discussing you know, a trillion dollar every year for Asia decarbonization. Of course, that's not our balance sheet size is not sufficient. So we can, how should I say, be a catalyst in identifying the opportunity, but we want, of course, all the, how should I say, uh, all hands on deck approach will be necessary. So banks can be play an important role, but we want investors, uh, asset managers, asset owners, everyone um, to be part of this journey together. Um, and we can probably uh, uh, play an important role to identify the opportunity and then uh, use capital market to mobilize more capital. Let me stop there, thank you. Thank you, Tomo. Um, perhaps we can go to Seiji next, um, it, providing the investor view on this on this journey, as, as Tomo said. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Seiji Kawazo, and thank you for having me here uh, at the uh, the uh, Unipa Unip Roundtable. Uh, and my name is Seiji Kawazo, and I'm, I'm working for the company called Sumitomo Mutual Trust as man and as, as a management, uh, and the, it's a part of the Sumitomo Mutual Trust Holdings. So we are a part of this uh, trust banking a group and we are in investment management service pro provider. Uh, we have as AUM about 700 billion US dollars and half of that comes from the equity investment and half of that will be from the fixed income. So uh, as I uh, talk, when I talk about the um, corporate, uh, the, cl the, um, the client engagement in, in, the co in this context is an investment into uh, the equity as an equity investor. So we are actually taking a ownership of those companies. So I think that is slightly different from Mr. Ishikawa-san's approach because um, I mean Ishikawa-san is mainly for the banking side, so it's on the so the lending and debt side. But we are uh, from the for the investor side, it would be more on the equity investment. So the equity investment dialogue will be reliant on obviously from the public, uh, publicly uh, uh, sort of disclosed information. So uh, uh, we what we do is to engage with the companies to have a disclosure on sustainability such as a framework such as TCFD on climate and the TNFD uh, if, if that becomes more um, uh, sort of um, established uh, for the natural capital. So we, uh, as an investment management company, uh, we would have a direct dialogue with a company uh, that we make investment. And for the investors like ourselves, we'll, uh, we'll sort of we, since we are um, equity holder of those companies, we are taking the uh, the company's um, management uh, responsible for those actions. So I think that is the, the more uh, with this investment management uh, companies like ourselves <coughs> will be focusing on the corporate governance related issues on this uh, on on this uh, sustainability finance. So I think that's uh, our approach uh, towards the um, engagement activities on the sustainability. And I think the and and also from the. Uh, invest management uh, services um, activities. Uh, we are involved in the various global initiatives such as um, uh, CO 100 plus for the climate ac climate actions, uh, and um, the CO 100 plus is the uh, the 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 so the in global engagement is initiatives uh, that have um, covering more than 160 companies with uh, high exposure to um, uh, the 
uh, greenhouse gas em emissions and the there are uh, the globally uh, global uh, asset owners and investment managers are involved in this dialogue uh, with those companies. So, so I think this, the, there'll be a more collaborative engagement with the asset owners and the uh, investment managers. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that is also a, one of the characteristics of our uh, engagement activities towards the um, climate, climate, climate and also sustainable agendas. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Seiji. Uh, Monica, how about you uh, representing an investor group? Right. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me today. Um, Monica Bay, uh, Director of Investor Practice at AIGCC. Um, and we support investors in Asia um, to really create a climate resilience economy towards net zero goals as well. Um, just before I go in, I just want to recognize the Koreans in this room because I myself am Korean. So if I would take um, a few seconds out um, to introduce myself in Korean, but I will repeat in English so um, you will also understand as well. 어, 먼저 여기 자리를 마련해 주신 거 정말 감사합니다. 저는 기후 변화 어, 투자자 그룹에서 온 배희은 이사입니다. 오늘 저희가 말씀드린 거는 저희가 한 70여 개 정도 되는 투자자 그럼 글로벌 투자자이기도 하고 그리고 아시아 투자자이기도 한데 대략 한 어, 미화로 한 32조 어, 달러 한국 돈으로 하면 한 4경 원 정도가 되죠. 그래서 어마어마하게 어떻게 보면 큰 투자자들 하고 기후 변화 관련돼서 저희가 업무를 전체적으로 하고 있습니다. 네. 어, um, it's sorry. I will switch back to English. So <laughs> yeah. I was just mentioning a very very quick introduction of myself in Korea. And so just um, that just recognizing that I am in Korea as well. Um, so I will probably introduce AIGCC and the work we do um, in terms of when I, we are defining what engagement really means for investors and the work we do around engagement as well. So one of the elements that uh, we look towards engagement really is supporting and equipping investors. So there's a, quite a lot of capacity building involved here of really understanding what needs to be done for investors to go out. And there's few elements to this. So one element is really um, internalizing it uh, for investors and having a proper investment pr process in place. And then there's the engagement portion where I would say there's two sets of engagements that happen. One, we call it corporate engagement, but it's really engagement with the portfolio companies of the investors. The second um, portion is what we call policy advocacy, where we would engage with policymakers or regulators on specific topics or some markets as well. So in terms of engagement, I would say the real goal of it is to accelerate the progress and to um, have action towards, maybe in this case for Asia, a um, 2030 target as well. Thanks very much, Monica. Uh, perhaps we can start with the the in investment view first. You know, I think the audience is always interested in hearing some sort of be best practice um, examples of of ESG considerations, investment strategies, engagement strategies as well. Um, do you have any examples that you could share, Seiji, of best practice guidelines um, of of what what you're currently doing? Uh, yes. Uh, of course, uh, we um, call it as an ESG integration into a portfolio, and the portfolio uh, strategies are based on the sort of um, individuals, portfolio managers, investment strategies. Uh, and within the strategy, there is a element of ESG integration. Uh, and here, uh, you would uh, sort of uh, consider uh, the factors which may drive the future company's um, future earnings growth or the um, risk profile of those companies. And as an investor, uh, we would like to avoid any, as much as risk as possible. And the, as an investor, we would like to see companies that will make investment into sort of uh, future opportunities. Uh, as, and so I think there are many elements of the sustainability uh, that has um, relates to say capa capacity constraints or the, um, the, the, the capacity, capacity building you know, so that the company is able to turn into uh, opportunities. 
uh, whereas if you have a large exposure to um, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, because of the tightening uh, regulatory constraints uh, and also the consideration of the carbon uh, pricing or the the, car the penalty that we may uh, uh, sort of may put upon all those um, corporate uh, corporate co uh, corporate uh, profitability, uh, then obviously we we have to uh, avoid those companies. So in those cases, we would sort of exclude those companies out of our portfolio. So. Uh, this is a kind of a, we call it ESG uh, uh, integration process, uh, and the I think the, the ESG uh, integration uh, focusing on the sustainability is now becoming more and more important for us. Thank you. Great. And how does engagement uh, form part of that that strategy? Yes. Yeah, so the um, as the companies have um, high risk, risk, high risk exposure to say cl climate risks, uh, obviously. As the companies uh, reduce the the level of the um, the, uh, those, uh, the the carbon emissions, uh, then then that will make the um, when the when when there is any sort of negative um, prospects of those um, uh, risks and being reduced, therefore we will uh, we would sort of make larger uh, equity holdings or the or the investment into it because uh, for the investment management company we have to we are measured against the investment performance of those companies. So uh, obviously uh, those are that comes the, the first sort of our focus in terms of the, our investment strategies and then we will sort of factor in any sort of risks, risks, and risks and opportunities that the companies may face in terms of sustainability factors. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Monica, do you, w what's, your, what's your view on that? Um, yes, yeah, so I would probably start at why um, investors would um, you know, act and engage with the investment company. So um, before the corporate engagement per se starts, I think a lot of investors really start with understanding the risks of their own portfolios. So um, Sage and Sang have mentioned about the risk assessments that's done internally, um, understanding the portfolios, and also doing a scenario analysis of the portfolios of where um, the impact would be whether it's a 1.5 degrees, uh, below 2 degrees, 2 degrees, or even now 3 degrees, etc. So depending on how the investors would actually define and want to do a scenario analysis, they would do a scenario ana analysis. And through the process is actually um, through this understanding that they actually build and mention, oh, we actually need to start the engagements as well. So. Um, as an example, because of my fellow um, panelists are from Japan, maybe the largest pension funds are in the world and in Japan as well, did a scenario analysis of their own portfolios. This was a um, few years back, I believe it's 2019, and the document was very public. And in that, they had mentioned almost 17% um, uh, was like um, a positive return in line with 1.5 degree scenario uh, compared to the baseline. So, I mean, these kind of um, factual based understanding of your portfolios, it's, it's a trigger to actually realize, okay, there's a real reason why investors should act and should move the real economy to align to um, a 1.5 degrees and what that means as well. Another factor I would say that plays a um, a growing role, in a sense, is some of the work uh, is done under the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance specifically, um, because uh, now globally there's um, over 300 asset managers who have joined uh, and committed to Net Zero under um, the Net Zero Ma Asset Management Initiative, which represents about, um, I would say, over 50% of the global assets under management at the moment. And within that, when you set the targets, um, the setting of targets actually comes of not only lo your finance portfolio emissions, but also how you are aligning your investments towards that net zero goal. And within there, there is a um, element of engagement as well. So there's an engagement portion of those targets as well. And this is why um, the corporate engagement here is a very, um, is a tool and an element and a focus as well. 
And some of the things I would say that they are within AIGCC, we um, run like two, a part of two major, I would say, corporate engagement initiative uh, programs. One is the Climate Action 100 Plus. So we are part of the Global Investment Network who run this. And for Asia, it is ourselves and PRI who are running it. Um, the other one is uh, the Asia Utilities Engagement Program, noting that energy transition is a big part of this work. So we work with um, seven utilities companies that sit outside of this um, Climate Action 100 Plus. And generally, the ask from investors that are like around governance, do you have proper governance around climates? Are the board accountable? And do you have that framework? The second element will probably be, do you have a credible decarbonization strategy and have you done the stress testings that are needed? And also, um, to see the progress over time, of course, you would need the uh, transparency and disclosure. And mainly that's through done through an annual process, uh, through various other uh, frameworks and platforms available. And now, increasingly, I would say there's a uh, focus around physical resilience as well that are being asked. And, of course, the public policy element uh, as well. Great, thank you. Um, since you, you, you mentioned Net Zero, you spoke about uh, the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance. Um, you know, Unibify hosts three of the Net Zero Alliances. Uh, Tom, you're involved in the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Perhaps we can start with you. How has, you know, the Net Zero Banking Alliance was launched two years ago. How has your involvement in the Net Zero Banking Alliance changed the way you, you engage with clients? Sure. Um, so we joined Net Zero Banking Alliance almost two years ago, exactly two years ago. Uh, we sit on the steering group, uh, which consists of 12 banks. I actually uh, participate the steering group every month. Um, discussion at the steering group, but also within the Net Zero Banking Alliance member is very, uh, so far, very useful, I think, for us, but also for other members and uh, hopefully for other members as well, but also for our corporate clients. Um, two years ago when we joined and uh, uh, what we actually started doing was to, to some extent, I, I don't wanna say educate, but we started talking to our clients, explaining what does net zero commitment means for our clients. Because uh, to some extent, this is, uh, uh, again, demystifying the role of finance, but sometimes we think that banks or maybe asset managers setting targets and all of a sudden the, the world will change. Of course, that the world is not gonna change simply because we said 30% interim target emission reduction or net zero by 2050, the world will say, okay, good luck, right? And the client will say, you know, okay, you, yeah, we saw you committing to net zero in the newspaper. Oh, by the way, we're going to do investment in XYZ and we would like to get financing. I mean, net zero commitment, 2030, 2050, but what does that mean for our clients? Um, that's what we started doing by engaging with our clients. So that's what we started doing two years ago. And to some extent, of course, not, uh, uh, we need to be mindful of the confidentiality, antitrust, but, uh, generalizing the feedback and we discussed among the Net Zero Banking Alliance some of the feedback I got from our clients. Um, I think the, the, the journey so far, almost two years, has been very interesting for MEFG because the more you engage with your clients, we told them how we plan to achieve our 2030 target, 2050 Net Zero target. But at the same time, our clients also told me, educated me, how they see their net zero journey. What is the plan? What is the strategy? What are the challenges? What are the dependencies? So it's to some extent mutual kind of educational process. That what That's how we ended up understanding what is our client trying to do. And collectively, our client's decarbonization will be our decarbonization because as I said in the beginning, we have existing exporters. We cannot cherry pick. We can't just say, oh, forget about this brown sector. Let's just focus on brown, uh, green sector. We don't, we're not in that position. We don't have the privilege. We can't just simply, you know, divest certain exporters. So we need to talk, we need to engage, we need to educate. We need, sometimes we need to respectfully challenge their transition plan. 
but that's the only way we can advance our net zero journey. So I think, of course, maybe without net zero banking alliance, m without uh, principle for responsible banking, we may have been doing the same, but collectively, net zero banking alliance sending us collective signal, I'm sure, uh, made a huge impact. And by us um, um, telling our clients, explaining our story, how we see our net zero journey, and it's not only MFG, other Japanese banks, other Asian banks, European, US, we're all collectively sending, maybe not exactly the same, but similar message that we all committed to net zero, 2030, 2050. I think gradually our clients are also understanding what does that mean for our clients. So to some extent, it's like reinforcing each other. We commit to net zero, we are explaining, and our clients are also coming up with uh, ambitious transition plan. We respectfully challenge, they become more ambitious. So it's a very interesting uh, interaction we've been having with our clients. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we will come back to the transition, um, uh, the, the assessment of the transition plans. Uh, but let's move on to, to Seiji, perhaps, and let's talk about uh, the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance, which I believe, Monica, you're also um, um, involved in and run for the Asia, uh, um, for, for Asia. Um, Seiji, so what did what did the as, uh, Net Zero Alliance change for you? Yes, in um, terms of uh, we, the Sumitomo Institute of Management uh, became signatory of the um, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative uh, two years ago, uh, and um, uh, I think the situation is similar to Mr. Ishikawa-san, that the we will the, we since we are investment into the company, so we probably it will be very difficult to have a micro ma micro ma manage those companies uh, in a certain way. Uh, so therefore, the all the carbon exposures of ourselves uh, will be a sort of as an aggregate of our total portfolio of ourselves. So therefore, uh, through our uh, through our uh, and, and net zero asset management initiative, uh, we are engaged with the companies in order to reduce the um, overall exposures of those companies uh, as, a, as an equity holder. Uh, and so we would sort of en encourage the senior level accountability, so to speak, uh, of, of, the, of those companies' uh, overall oper operations uh, in order to reduce uh, the, the carbon exposures or, and align themselves with the, the Paris code. Uh, level of the uh, of, of the target, uh, and um, and then it's the con continuous engagement uh, dialogue process, and which will be also done collaboratively with other uh, investment managers who are in in in, in, the, in the same journey towards net zero. Thank you. And Monica, do you have anything to say um, from the net zero asset manager's point of view? Um, yes. So. In terms of net zero asset managers, there are elements where um, the asset managers will commit and then within the year they are expected to set a target. Here it's the l not only the long term target, but especially the interim target, whether it's twen th 2025 or 2030. And um, afterwards, there are certain elements they are expected to do as well in terms of transparency and accountability. So, of course, there's the disclosure element to this. And for net zero asset managers, um, it, the expectation is they will disclose either through uh, PRI or CDP. Um, and on top of that, uh, another expectation really is to build a investor climate action plans. And within the investor action climate plans, which Sumitomitsu Trust um, Asset Manager has done very well, and they have it um, publicly open on their website, is that um, there are elements to it. So this is not really a transition plan for the portfolio companies, but for themselves. And there are investment, like there's areas of investment. So which areas of investments you're looking into, and Within there, there's corporate engagement, policy advocacy, um, disclosure, and the overall um, governance as well. So within these different areas, there's an expectation for these asset managers to have a plan in line with the targets as well. Um, Seiji, do you think there's any reputational financial risks associated with not you know, engaging with your clients for decarbonization? Um, I think the 
uh, the you have a much more regulatory sort of uh, constraint, so to speak, uh, in terms of doing business, actually. And when you look at the uh, situation uh, in Europe, for example, they have a um, business directive that will sort of um, the force companies who are doing businesses in Europe uh, to, uh, to actively comply with the, these climate standards. So uh, in real business cases, now we're actually starting to see those things happening. So uh, not only the reputation risks, but also, also there is a business impact because of those uh, tightening situations. So <coughs> I think the, uh, the, f the future of those uh, level of those uh, regulatory risks and also the, um, in some way, there are opportunities, but the, the risks that, uh, that the, um, the companies may face are still, uh, you know, there are still unknown areas that we need to uh, sort of um, analyze. Okay, um, so uh, I think you know we've we've mentioned the, the the regulatory side as well, and you know there is some supervisory gui guidance on on client engagement in the region. Um, but perhaps Tomo, we could we could talk about we could talk about that. You know what what policy regulatory reforms or guidance is required that would really support engagement? Sure. Um, needless to say regulation or policy, policy makers have very important role to play uh, to facilitate our net zero journey, but not our net zero because at the end of the day, the world doesn't care whether it's, you know, we achieve net zero or not. It's the, the planet level net zero, that's critical. And the good news is that, um, um, as I said in the beginning, we have $3 trillion of balance sheet our balance sheet to reflect the underlying economy. So I always say that uh, we never get to net zero unless the world become net zero. So our interest is exactly aligned, right? How do we get net zero, real economy net zero is also our target. We're not just talking about our net zero because as I said, balance sheet net zero or paper decarbonization doesn't mean anything. So what does that mean? Um, I wanna talk about this real economy policy and also financial policy or regulation. In the context of uh, um, real economy uh, policies, um, of course, I'm sure it's um, uh, all of us are in a similar spot, but we committed to net zero, but I'm sure the asset managers will say the company has to be profitable. Of course, right? You know, we're not just talking about CO2 reduction only. The company has to be profitable and uh, they need to be focusing on how they can reduce the carbon footprint. Same for us. Um, we need to make reasonable return. We're not talking about like, you know, such a uh, um, high return, but reasonable return. And there are some technologies that are not bankable yet. And if the, the stakeholder or if somebody says you, MEFG, you're a commercial bank, you have tons of money, you need to lend to certain technology, we will of course do that to the extent we can get uh, appropriate return based on the risk. But we cannot or we should not be taking a risk that we do not think is appropriate. And it's the government who can allocate the subsidies or capital to make projects bankable. So that's where the government can and has to play an important role for, the, for us to be able to finance uh, new technologies or project finance for the Japan or Asia to, uh, to roll out the low carbon uh, technologies. And I would say the US Inflation Reduction Act, I would say that was a clearly a game changer because until then, the EU taxonomy, of course, some uh, many good policies announced in Asia, uh, Japan, et cetera, et cetera, but clearly the IRA was a game changer because the US basically said, yes, we're going to address climate change, but through providing such a huge tax credit Right. And then all of a sudden you see a lot of US company and not US companies as well, investing in US, of course, investing in re green activities, but not from philosophical perspective, but they're just saying this makes sense. This, you know, we can get a uh, good return and that's why they're making investment. So I think the government subsidies or allocating capital to make those projects bankable and project uh, uh, investable, I think that's very important for the government to, to consider what can they do not only just you know, applying stick, but some sort of carrot will be required. In, in the context of a financial regulation, um, I, I know there are so many banks uh, representatives here, 
um, many financial supervisors, or most of them, they're focused on risk management, which is, which is understandable. That's, the, that's the, the role of financial regulator or supervisors. But if they're too much focused on short-term risk, um, if the supervisors start asking, you need to manage, mitigate risk in a, like, you know, uh, we s heard about the stress testing. Stress testing, of course, is important, but at the end of the day, uh, we should not be just thinking about how can you manage or mitigate the risk, but how can you actually be part of this net zero project, 20, 30 year project, but still manage the risk. And uh, I think it was Eric earlier, we need to be risk seeker. And that's, uh, uh, that's exactly how we should be positioning ourselves as, uh, as opposed to, you know, just focusing on risk and, uh, you know, putting uh, uh, the kind of social impact as a secondary priority because we're in the business of managing the risk, not avoiding the risk. So I would, um, I want the supervisor and regulator uh, using financial policies and regulations to encourage banks to take higher risk. I mean, manageable, but higher risk so that over time, uh, banks can manage and mitigate the risk as opposed to say you shouldn't be taking risk and of course we can avoid risk but if all of us uh, start avoiding risk then there's no money being allocated to you know low carbon technologies and uh, we're all toasted which is not uh, where we want to be thank you thanks so much um, Monica as a collective investor voice what's you know sticking to the reg regulatory theme what's on your a, what's already been done, B, what's on your wish list for investors? Um, so I will explain some of the areas of policy advocacy that has been done up until today, what elements we are looking to do, and maybe the reasons behind that as well. So um, as part of a global investor network, in the past and uh, currently today, like just last month as well, we would send um, letters to either governments in certain markets or on a global level um, because uh, quite a lot of the investors are actually concerned around maybe the lack of action taken, concrete actions taken by the governments. So it's um, so for example, there was a letter to the Japanese government uh, before G7 from ourselves, PRI, and CDP. Uh, for Korea, um, like we have sent a letter to the Presidential uh, Carbon Neutrality Committee as well. So there are actions and elements where we do as a collectively. However, I think. Um, linking, going back to the corporate engagement side, one of the things that investors have really recognized, and it's somewhat, um, you know, it's mentioned by some of our other panelists, is that the risk is still underlining, even if you engage with a few of um, clients for banks, um, portfolio companies, for asset managers. And there's a real reason to address the systemic risk that's out there, um, created by climate change. And to address that, that really comes from engaging with policymakers and understanding it as well. So um, linking to some of our work, especially in the utilities area that we've been doing for the past few years, we have since last year started engaging on sp specific themes with um, around tables with uh, investors and some policy government officials and um, financial regulators as well, just to, so that there is a mutual understanding and a dialogue um, similar to what we've had with corporate engagement as well, but on the policy side as well. And this is where um, it was very, you know, he mentioned the IRA and the subsidiaries from governments. Those kind of um, actions or decisions taken by governments really actually uh, affect the investments that are made. And as everyone knows, there are huge opportunities out there in the transition um, area and financing the transition as well. And depending on how or where the subsidiaries are, it does make a difference to how fast or what to, to what scale the investments are made as well. And to that degree, I would almost say um, 
So it's understanding the greater tool, as I had mentioned, uh, the systemic risk, um, the portfolios overall, depending on the scenario of 1.5 or otherwise, it, it does make a big difference. And just looking at uh, from a capital asset, you know, allocation side of things, where the investment should be made should be thought from you know, how fast or to what scale we can move the market towards um, the net zero scenario. So if you look into, um, say, there's, you know, we generally, like a lot of the investors, like I'm just going to mention three. So um, the IEA, NGFS, or even like the Bloomberg um, BNF, like net zero scenario analysis, and look at the um, investments that, that are needed or the different level of energy mix that is needed. There is a role, I would say, for some of the um, technologies, decarbonized technologies as well, but also you know, some of the other areas that have come out through this analysis of a much greater focus that's needed around renewable energy and um, grid as well. So if you're just basing off, like, off the, where the asset allocation and invest the great investments should be made in, I think it's good to tie back to some of the actual facts and um, research that's done, and also to for the policy uh, elements to incorporate that into the policies as well. Thank you very much. Um, let's go back to something um, something Thomas said, but this is, will be a question to to Seiji first. Um, Tommy, you said the company needs to be profi profitable. Um, you know, Seiji, what, what's your view on balancing the trade-offs between, um, you know, returns and engagement? How do you strike that balance? Um, I think the, we feel that the, um, the, there's too much sort of control uh, over, over a certain investment, in investees. Uh, it doesn't sort of really make sense. And it has, it, I think the, as an investment management, as a management company, we would encourage uh, investment. And still, when you look at the climate-related climate related, um, areas, and also in some cases natural natural capital-related areas, uh, there are more capital needed. So we sort of um, have a we should have a sort of more flexible uh, sort of um, sort of a framework, I would speak, I would say, uh, towards those some um, capital allocation, private money, and as the uh, more money uh, have uh, put in into place, I think there will be a sort of investment performance uh, will be sort of um, realized through those investments. Great, thank you very much. Um, Tom, anything to add to that? Sure, um, so uh, this project, Net Zero Journey, that we all started two years ago, three years ago, whatever you started, uh, this is all about sustainability, right? And um, this project has to be sustainable as well. If we only prioritize, if you were to balance the uh, return impact and client strategy, if you only prioritize or uh, think about one and forget about others, the product itself or this huge undertaking will not be sustainable. So how do you balance all these three full factors and making sure you can pursue all of them together I think would be important so that this project can continue another 20, 30 years abo as opposed to just another two, three years and everyone forget you know, about this uh, net zero. Um, how do we do that? So uh, yes, it's true that the, the client, uh, we need to uh, make sure that the clients are uh, making reasonable return. We also need to make reasonable return, uh, but of course we need to uh, make impact. Um, how do we do that? Uh, the way we think about it, and maybe it's similar to asset managers, um, uh, Monica, I think you mentioned about aligning. Um, we don't think we would align our portfolio uh, given, as I said, the systemic size or balance sheet. However, we can encourage our client to be more ambitious, but at the same time, I don't think we have the, the influence to say, you know, you shouldn't go that way. That strategy doesn't work for you. Instead, you, sh you must go this way. I don't think we are in the business of doing that, nor do we should we be doing that because at the end of the day, we're just an enabler of net zero. We're not in the driver's seat. 
So we need to um, uh, basically allow, or w it's our client who will me be making those strategic decisions. But again, uh, the, the, the phrase I always use is, uh, there's no transition without transition finance. So our role is to, to finance their transition plan. Of course, the transition plan has to be credible. But again, if the plan is 20, 30 years long, I don't know who can guarantee the credibility. Of course, there are you know, some third party verification, but still, is, does that mean if somebody says, provides a stamp of approval saying this is credible? Mm, there's no like perfect strategy when we don't even know what's gonna happen six months from now, <laughs> let alone six years, 30 years from now. So again, we need to um, uh, follow our clients uh, respectfully challenge their transition plan, making sure transition plans are credible. And, but at the same time, we need to provide um, uh, value. Why is it that we can be part of this journey together with our clients? We need to align our interest so that clients will come to us for financing as, as opposed to any financing because you know, you know, money can come from anywhere, but it would be nicer if our clients come to us because our, how should I say, net zero commitment is also um, something they value as opposed to just go to whomever will provide the lowest, um, uh, the cheapest funding because if you start doing that, there will be, it will be a race to uh, bottom as opposed to race to top. So how can we, as I said, reinforce each other? That's the critical bit. So I don't think it's about uh, profit or impact, rather we need to pursue all of them together so that uh, this undertaking is truly sustainable. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm just very aware of the time and we'll come to you, Monica. Is there any audience questions uh, that any of the panelists can answer before we maybe move? No, okay. Um, Monica, do you want to address that question or should sure. we move? Um, I can. Do you want me to? No, no, <laughs> okay. it's all good. Um, so there were some comments where Tom Sang mentioned around transition plans for 20, 30 years. Um, I want to kind of rethink that in a way because 20, 30 years is actually um, the investment horizon of some of the investors we work with. So these are the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds. They actually do have a 20-year time horizon and they think about what will be the impact of our portfolios 20 years from now. And the scenario analysis and the work they do and the understanding of the portfolios is actually built around that horizon. Um, but for majority of financial institutions or you know, other investors, the time horizon is quite different. And it's quite important to acknowledge the investment time horizons as well. Um, in understanding the transition and the transition risk or just um, the approaches as well. And just one thing that I um, would like to mention is that the reason why this 2030 interim targets keeps on coming up again and again and again is that um, we, uh, for a lot of cases, we're looking at five to seven years. It's really that time frame of scale and speed um, to accommodate, and depending on that, I think you know what you know the transition plans of companies and investors will be quite different. Um, so maybe perhaps we can talk about um, we can sort of go inside the finance institution and let's talk about maybe the capacity building side, client facing roles, assessment of transition plans, um, you know, looking at data. Um, what's you know, what do we, what do financial institutions need to do? Perhaps we can start with Tomo on, on building the capacity there so that we can move forward. Yeah, um, so two things. Um, first of all, transition plan, as I said, our role would be to finance transition plan of our clients. But um, how do you assess transition plans? Uh, but at the same time, uh, making sure that uh, our clients also appreciate our inputs, as I said, right? We can't just go to our clients and say, show me your plan. Oh, this is horrible. No, you gotta be more ambitious. Do something, come back to me. You know, that, that's, then they'll say, you're, you're not invited, right? So how can we actually add value so that our clients want to come to us 
and say, we want to get your financing, uh, financing from you, and we want the continuous uh, advice from you. Um, and for us to do that, we need to be looking, uh, be able to uh, assess transition plan, uh, but also provide uh, innovative solution. And when, we, when I say this innovative solution, I often receive a question saying, oh, that, does that mean sustainability linked loan or sustainability linked bonds, et cetera, et cetera. I, uh, the, my reply would be yes and no. Um, there, of course, these sustainability linked loan bonds, these uh, technical solution may help, may help. But if I, I've been engaging with a leading company, Japanese clients, Asian clients, and if I go to a CEO or a CFO and tell them, oh, um, maybe we can uh, come up with a solution linking your performance with um, uh, some KPI and we can provide you, I don't know, 20 basis going up or down, a CFO or C CRE CEO may say that's great, but I mean, at the end of the day, if we're talking about leading Korean, Japanese, Asian companies, 20 basis point for, I don't know, let's say 200 million loans, I mean, is, is that a big deal? Maybe, yes, but that's not gonna change the corporate strategy, right? How do you incentivize the whole of company, whole of management to be more ambitious has to be the question, as opposed to say, maybe we can give you a bit of a discount here, there. Again, I'm not suggesting that's not a solution, but that's just a micro solution. We need to think about macro level engagement with, uh, maybe it's similar to equity, uh, holder, but that's how we want to engage with our corporate clients so that they feel our inputs are pretty helpful, not because of 20, 30 basis going up or down, but rather they feel our suggestion advice are pretty, uh, very helpful. So that's one thing we need to train our bankers so that our clients truly appreciate not MEFG as a whole, but you know particular bankers' expertise. Uh, of course, that will take some time, but. Uh, this net zero banking alliance discussion, transition finance guide that we uh, led to develop uh, with uh, uh, UNEP FI secretariat, all of these uh, experience have uh, uh, allowed us to uh, collectively learn from the process. So that's uh, that's what we've been doing. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that we, we were there yet, but all of these process have been very valuable. One more thing um, about data. Um, as I said in the beginning, we have access to data, the senior management, our corporate clients, et cetera, et cetera. And we're not relying on uh, publicly available uh, disclosure only. Meaning we have more information, uh, we can identify opportunities. But as I said, that we're not going to dominate everything. We need to be able to distribute the product to the capital market. How do we do that? Uh, we need to be able to assess transition plan based on the, the, through the lens of banking uh, lending, but we also need to make sure that the investors feel comfortable uh, in, uh, in investing these opportunities. But maybe that we can find opportunities based on all the information we have, but that may not be fully described or disclosed in the publicly available information, which is to some extent could be a risk because uh, the uh, outside investors or stakeholder may say that's a greenwash, that's not a transition, right? Maybe we have more access to information, the, the convincing strategy over the 20, 30 years. So we, we may be convinced, but the investor may not be. So how do you narrow the gap so that all the investors, all the, um, the stakeholder uh, globally are convinced as much as we are when uh, identifying the opportunity? So data, is important, data availability is important, but the more our clients start disclosing uh, based on ISSB or IFRAG, SEC, whatever, regionally, so that uh, the data availability, but also transition plan availability will, I should say, equalize the, the uh, data availability, data access will clearly uh, benefit all of us, not only banks, but also all the uh, capital market participants. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm just very aware of the time, so we'll come to you, Seiji, quickly, yeah. and then we'll end with you, Monica. Yeah, just sorry. Yes, just please. one comment on yes, the uh, what Mrs. Shikawa-san said, uh, and I just want to sort of um, emphasize that the sustainable finance is a really challenge for the corporate governance, and the I think the corporate governance really uh, has to sort of embrace this sustainable finance in terms of transparency, uh, and the I think the the the, uh, the companies has to be. Hold, held accountable for any actions, and, and I, I think that, that that is true. And when you look at the 
frameworks such as TCFD or TNFD, it also has that kind of element of, of senior management of the companies uh, who, who are able to um, analyze, assess their corporate exposures. And I think that is a very important aspect of sustainable finance. Thank you. Thank you. Any final remarks from you, Monica? I'll just make it very short. I think in our first question, we started off with differences. And in a way, our conclusion kind of comes together on more similarities, actually, than differences. Um, which is interesting because at the end, we are trying to encourage and understand the companies that we engage with and help them move to a certain direction as well. And there are certain elements that um, are different, but many similarities as well. And uh, in the area of corporate engagement, I see, uh, in a way, I, there's a reason why there are over 700 investors that are participating as part of Climate Action 100 Plus globally. Um, for Asian investors, I would say, um, recently there's been more interest because there's a very big learning curve internally as well, understanding what um, the investment views are, but also what the corporate is doing as well. So there is an understanding that is a, capa a capacity building internally that happens by participating in these um, engagements. And another aspect that I see, a trend that I see is we started off with maybe Climate Action 100, but now we are seeing a lot more different types of engagement. So there's thematic engagements that are being planned and um, the area is expanding both in themes and regions. So we probably see a lot more of it um, cut going forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have one minute left, so perhaps 10 seconds each. Um, any, <laughs> we'll start with you, Seiji, any, um, any words of encouragement? Well, I think the uh, journey is long and we are in the same boat and the, we have to be thinking about holistically uh, and the collaboratively to, uh, to, um, to actually uh, reach the goal of the pa Paris Accord. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thomas? Sure. Um, I was going to say this. Diff we started with difference, but uh, um, uh, we're aligned. Uh, but you said this already, so I'm not going to say something different. We, I recently co-authored an uh, op-ed on Nikkei Asia with uh, our colleagues from Indonesia uh, Finance Ministry. We ended this op-ed saying, when the world is burning, the size of capital mobilization matters. I think I would say the same thing. I mean, sometimes we're trying to pursue perfect investment opportunities where you risk is uh, very, uh, you, you can understand the risk and the return is there, et cetera, et cetera. But if we just cherry pick, we will not be able to mobilize uh, sufficient capital. So the, I think it's important to understand that we need to mobilize trillions of dollars going forward to Asia. How can we do that? We need to reverse engineer as opposed to just pick and choose whatever you know you feel comfortable. Because if we feel uh, if we only do what we feel comfortable, again we will be toasted. Great. And final words of encouragement from you. Um, so I mentioned speed and scale. It's very important at this stage. And I would say, you know, investors could um, make, reorganize their portfolio, whether that's something that they would do or not. But to address climate change, I think it's much a broader element than their own portfolio. So that's something that I think a lot of people acknowledge and are working together as well. Brilliant, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tomo. Thank you, Seiji. Um, and uh, with that, we will end the day.